Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Trini Alexander. I'll be t talking about uh, powering up eBay OpenStack Cloud and what goes on under the hood. So I've been with uh, eBay for about uh, seven months, and uh, there's a lot of uh, um, learning and uh, the, the, the massive scale of eBay. It's, it's in, absolutely incredible. So uh, let me quickly walk you through the agenda. So uh, I want to talk about cloud architecture. How do you build for scale? Um, what are the, the things that goes under the, the cloud lifecycle management? How do we bootstrap a cloud? How do we uh, add capacity? And also, we want to talk about the, some of the future directions that we are thinking. So before I begin, I would want to talk about uh, eBay, PayPal, uh, the business and the, 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 the demanding business. So, so if you look at eBay, we have about 157 million active users globally. PayPal, it's present in 203 markets worldwide. So both have a lot of transactions happening, which requires a uh, highly scalable um, dynamic cloud. So the eBay OpenStack, eBay PayPal OpenStack cloud roughly looks like this. So the, in its entirety, we have over 12,000 hypervisors, and that keeps uh, growing on a daily basis. We have 300,000 virtual cores, uh, 70,000 VMs, over 1.6 petabytes of uh, provision storage, uh, we, are, we have more than 10 AZs, 15 VPCs, and uh, we're currently on uh, version Havana, uh, but we're in the process of upgrading to Juno. All right, so I wanted to talk about the, the cloud architecture a little bit, some of the, the fundamental design principles. So um, the uh, the cloud is in eBay's uh, world, well, we have uh, different regions. Each region has uh, different AZs. So we, we plan for um, failure. We want to distribute the, the workloads. It's not all in one region. So if you want to horizontally scale, for example, we want to add more regions, more AZs. So, so that's the, the fundamental principle. And uh, the, the key thing is around planning for failure. Things could go wrong either at the AZ level or at the region level or between um, regions, there could be loss of connectivity or between AZ. So we have a uh, plan for failure and uh, the shared nothing uh, model. So um, most of these services are in the shared nothing, but there are very select few services, like Keystone, for example, we have a, a shared um, um, model. <clears throat> All right, so um, how, does, uh, how do we look at uh, the, the cloud lifecycle management? So we have there's a lot of uh, moving pieces under the hood. So fundamentally, we have grouped it into these four uh, big functions. So we have provision, deployment, monitor, and remediate. So provision is basically doing a bootstrap of the cloud, uh, setting up your uh, regions, AZs, uh, deploying all the OpenStack services, um, and on top of that, the, the tenant's uh, workloads. The um, deployment is basically upgrading your control plane, doing uh, software rollouts, uh, config changes, et cetera. And of course, if you have a cloud that's running at scale, you want to monitor it and uh, uh, listen for uh, health. And if it's uh, deteriorating, we want to do the uh, remediation almost near real time. So if I expand these uh, four bubbles, like I said, you know, the, the first one is the, um, the, the cloud build out. The second one is you know, doing the ongoing software deployments, monitoring, and remediation. So uh, what I'd like to do is you know, uh, go through sort of the pre-step of building a cloud. How do you bootstrap a cloud? So we have a, a process called rack onboarding. So um, there's a lot of uh, pre-work that goes into building a cloud. So there's a lot of plans in terms of you know, uh, what data center, what AZ, what uh, network bubble, what uh, rack location, et cetera. These are all planned out. And um, the, the gear lands into the on-premise, gets wired up and powered on. At that point, there's a, a whole bunch of automation that happens to get that rack onboarded nicely into the system. So um, in the, there's a, it all flows from a, a ticketing mechanism. So there's a bootstrap ticket that gets filed with all the rack profile, the assets, SKU information, et cetera. And uh, when the, the, the rack is powered on, all the information is uploaded. There's a uh, pixie boot that happens, and the, uh, uh, there's an image that, a custom image that we download onto all the assets, which does a scan of the system, collects all the infrastructure, I mean, the asset level information, 
uploads it into a, a central re repository, we call it a payload. So that's basically what's the, what it really has. And in the, rack, uh, in the bootstrap ticket, we have all the, the rack profile asset SKU information. So we do a cross check with that and to make sure it is the, the right uh, SKU that landed on premise and we onboard it correctly. And also we do a whole bunch of checks like uh, we do a LOM check to make sure that the, the BMC uh, is accessible. You know, you can do out of band management. Um, you set up the network interfaces, uh, the relationships between VLAN subnet, bu uh, the, the um, bubble, et cetera. And also we uh, try to calculate the asset fault domain. And once that's done, we go and update our internal CMDB with all the, 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 the uh, asset uh, rack model information. So at that point, we're pretty much done with the, the rack onboarding, but we do a one final step of um, spinning up a test compute and making sure these are really uh, functional, right? So that's a, so the, the last step. And another thing I wanted to call out is we do a, we only qualify a, a rack as onboarded if more than 90% of the assets are uh, working and functioning, right? So if it's not, we would automatically, by the way, any of these steps, if it fails, we'll file a ticket which gets uh, assigned to a team which works with the vendor and fixes the, the faulty hardware. Sometimes we get faulty hardware assets on, trying to get on board, they're stuck in the queue. But the key thing is we catch it early and detect and remediate quickly. So this is, this is a process that's completely automated from the, the once the, the rack is powered, it's a fully automated process. This used to take weeks to get done. Now, uh, with the automation, we have a time savings of you know, from weeks going to a few hours. So that's, that's an incredible savings. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is once you onboard the, the rack, all these assets, they go through a certain life cycle. So the life cycle, there's uh, all the way from ordered. Ordered basically is you've ordered the asset working with the vendor to get that on, on premise. Once it lands on premise, it goes into something called cold cache. And uh, once it's onboarded through the previous process, it would be in the warm cache. So it's basically ready to be consumed. And once the uh, assets are allocated, they go, obviously go into the allocated queue. And last but not the least, as you know, there are assets that goes end of life, so we want to do the tech refresh. So that goes into the DCOM. So there's another state I haven't called out here. It's just called faulty. So any, any, between warm cache and DCOM, it could go into a faulty state based on multiple reasons. So we have that state as well uh, that I haven't really called out in the workflow. So what does this get us? We could look at our entire cloud and figure out what are the assets in which state. So it gives us a, a view into the system. So this is a, a sample data I cut out so we have all these caches um, between ordered, um, cold cache, warm cache, allocated, and uh, um, I have faulty here as well, right? So the key thing here is this gives us the insight to operate our cloud at a uh, much more efficient level in terms of like the, the asset utilization. Um, if things are stuck in cold cache, then it's indicative of a problem that in our onboarding processes, not efficient. If things are in the faulty state and that's expanding, that shows us um, the uh, insights into your, your, you have a lot of infrastructure, but you're not efficiently utilizing it. And same thing with uh, warm cache, if the capacity gets depleted, it's uh, a trigger to the, the, the capacity team to uh, onboard um, new uh, capacity into the warm cache or the, from the cold cache to warm cache. So uh, this basically provides us uh, the, uh, like I said, the operational efficiency operating cloud you know, at a cost optimal way and uh, reacting to faulty assets very quickly. And this gives us the data transparency and the data confidence uh, to operate our cloud better. Um, next thing I want to talk about is the, the capacity add process. So uh, we have uh, racks onboarded and uh, we want to add that into the, um, into the respective uh, OpenStack services, so we have a uh, internal tooling, again, fully automated, which would do a provision of the hypervisor to um, adding it to the various uh, subsystems, like you know, uh, registering with Foreman, Nova, uh, doing the network onboarding, and doing a, a test of the 
uh, of the uh, newly provisioned hypervisor basically by doing a, um, a test uh, VM uh, provision and also trying to check for IP pings and uh, reachability, et cetera. So once it's all, all those tests are, all those various uh, steps are passed, is when we would do a, uh, the enable hypervisor. So the key thing there is we don't want to enable it until it's fully onboarded, because otherwise you will have a half onboarded um, hypervisor, which would take workloads and it gets into a messy state. So this again is in a, a fully automated process, which um, we have, uh, we used to take uh, days to do this, you know, now it's uh, within a few minutes. So there's a, a reverse process as well, offboarding. So it's sometimes assets go, hypervisors drift and uh, they get into a state where we want to like, uh, remove them from the system. So the previous process, if you kind of reverse that, you get into the, um, the, uh, the offboarding process, the same thing, fully automated process with, um, uh, it operates within a few minutes. So that's the, um, a bit of the, uh, the cloud bootstrapping. So I want to jump into um, things uh, that we do on an ongoing basis, which is capacity management. So we have a lot of uh, VMs that uh, users create, spin up. So any, any person within eBay who has a, um, a badge basically can spin up a VM and do their uh, stuff. And the, the key thing for us is we want to make sure it's uh, not it's uh, regulated, not, well, regulated is probably the wrong word, but we want to make sure it is uh, effectively utilized, all the VMs. So um, what we do is, you know, we look at all the VMs' uh, utilization, and if it's underutilized based on certain triggers, we would create some leads, and with uh, the leads generated, we would work with the, the VM owners to say, hey, this is underutilized. Would you like to, uh, we'll send them an email. Would you like to delete it? or extend the tenure, or do nothing. If it's a do nothing or a delete, of course the delete will delete the VM, but if they do nothing within 14 days, we would shut down the VM and give a grace period of about seven more days to, before we delete the VM in case something, some important work is lost because of the employees on vacation or whatever. And by the way, we send, when we send the email, we send it to the VM owner as well as the direct supervisor of the, the VM owner just in case if uh, folks are out. So this is, um, this is an ongoing process, uh, fully automated. You can see that that's a, pretty much a theme here. Um, and till date, we have reclaimed about 15,000 VMs. That's, that's a huge deal. So th this is basically looking at your, your usage and your, you're trying to run your cloud at optimal uh, capacity and also the best uh, efficiency. All right, so um, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, the, uh, how do we monitor cloud. So if you look at the, the, the four bubbles, like I uh, said earlier, one of the things is monitoring. So we use uh, Zabbix internally to monitor our OpenStack services. So we monitor hypervisors, OpenStack services, and also uh, Zabbix is um, per AZ. So we want to make sure if uh, the Zabbix service on one AZ goes off, it is detected and remediated. So there's a cross AZ SABIX monitoring as well. And uh, once the monitoring detects uh, an issue or an incident, there's a capability to alert. So we have uh, various levels of alert. Um, there's a pager duty for high level, high critical alerts, you know, basically what wakes up somebody in cloud ops team or email if it's a um, not critical but high alert and if it's not a uh, crucial alert or a medium size alert, it files a JIRA ticket. So why do, why do we need uh, alerting? It's, uh, it's pretty obvious, you know, we want to monitor the health of the cloud and be uh, humming along very nicely. If there are issues, we want to detect it very quickly and react to it fast. And uh, one of the things that uh, I want to call out is, you know, it's more of a, uh, from our experience, we, we went uh, a little, crazy with building, creating all these alerts, and a lot of them were, they were not really actionable, right? So you wanna, you wanna be very careful when you um, build out alerts. You wanna make sure each alert has a, uh, it's actionable and meaningful, right? And uh, if you have an alert, you should have an equivalent runbook that lists all the things that you do when that alert happens. And if you don't really have a runbook, you really have to question, do you 
what is the purpose of the ML alert. And one of the things that we did around um, the, the Jira tickets is, you know, all the, the, the low or medium alerts, we just file a Jira ticket. It doesn't even surface on email or doesn't surface on anybody's uh, pager duty. So it's, it's uh, containing the volume very nicely. Um, Zabbix architecture, I'll, I'm sure it's a ton of material out there on the Zabbix site, but um, this is, uh, just want to call out, you know, there's Zabbix agents, Zabbix uh, server, Zabbix database, and the Zabbix frontend. So agents are installed on all the hypervisors that collects information from um, various um, hosts and feeds it into the Zabbix database. Zabbix database monitors the, the operating range. If the signal falls off that operating range, it will create a, it will go from OK to problem state or problem state to OK state based on the, the good, good or bad. And uh, there's uh, an alerter service that would do the necessary action. It could be a Jira ticket, it could be an email, it could be um, sending out a pager duty alert. All right, so moving on. Another thing we do is you know, we collect, uh, we have a lot of information um, across our um, AZs, across various systems. So we have uh, Zabbix, for example, that collects the metrics from various uh, hypervisors. We have uh, all the, the, the Nova, Cinder, Keystone databases. We have our own internal um, CMDB and uh, the, the user databases that we have, and we could pull all the information from that and create uh, um, analytics on top of it. So what we've done is, you know, we think of it as, uh, it's an ELK uh, cluster, so we pull all the information into a elastic search cluster from all the various AZs into one central uh, repo. And from there, we can cut different dashboards for, you know, in evalu investigating things, or we have um, dashboards so that we have uh, that we watch on a regular basis. Like, for example, there's an alert dashboard or a uh, compute provision dashboard. So we have all these things, capabilities. And the, the power of this is, you know, you can actually look at an alert incident and pretty much drill down to, sometimes, you know, you have a stream of alerts coming in, you go to the alert dashboard, you can actually uh, find out which region it's coming from, which AZ, which hypervisor, to the VM level. So that's, that's pretty powerful in terms of quickly uh, reacting to some incident and uh, getting to the, to the bottom of it. The, the, the next bit I want to cover is the, the cloud infrastructure remediation. So this is the, um, um, the, the bit where infrastructure goes bad, like um, assets, uh, hypervisors. So how do you uh, react to it and how do you handle that? So doing with, with eBay scale, it's, you have to have automation in place to manage this effectively. So what we've uh, put together is a, a remediation um, uh, software that uh, basically it has a whole bunch of uh, automated remediation jobs that run on um, alerts. And uh, there's a ops console where they, the, the cloud operations team can go in and uh, do all the things that they can do directly um, with the, um, the hypervisor. They can do it from the tooling itself. Like, for example, they can see the asset based on the asset ID or the FQDN. They can uh, click on a cog that does, you know, reboot hypervisor. All those uh, various actions can be performed. And also, there's uh, uh, reports on all the jobs that are being performed. You know, like uh, there's a lot of uh, nightly um, or uh, daily jobs that get executed. So you can see the status of that in a, in a nice um, report console. And uh, there's another thing that we recently added. So oftentimes, we get into the situation of migrating workloads. So um, migrating workloads could be because you're your hypervisor is running too hot, uh, and you want to move certain workloads off of that, or you're dealing with tech refresh, or there are some specific um, use cases that we had to recently deal with within eBay. So um, we, uh, we've been doing this um, a lot. So we, what we did is you know, we automated that whole process of migrating workloads, so basically uh, flexing up new uh, VMs onto new hypervisors and flexing down the ones that are running on the, the the source hypervisor. So that helps, like for example, if you're running a hot hypervisor, when you migrate workloads, it cools down the, the, um, the running hot hypervisors. And we do that primarily because we want to be DR ready. So we want all the hypervisors to be operating at a certain uh, range and not above that. 
Okay. So hypervisors go down. How do you uh, handle that? So uh, we want to do a near real-time detection, and we want to do a near real-time remediation when hypervisors go down. So um, we have the monitoring system. We check against uh, signals, and if uh, the hypervisor is not reachable, that flags the, we need to flag the remediation engine to go uh, remediate the, the, the hypervisor down issue. But we don't want, we want to be careful here because uh, if there's a site-wide incident like a network glitch or something, you don't want to react to these signals. So we have a, a sort of a, a quiet period before we alert the remediation engine to go do the uh, hypervisor down um, remediation. So what do we do as part of the remediation? The first thing we want to do is you know, find out all the VMs that's running on the, the, the bad hypervisor and notify the, the owners of the, the VM saying that your VM went down because of a hypervisor down issue. Here's the best practice in terms of you know, setting up your high availability um, VM cluster. And uh, if it's uh, production applications, we already have automation which would spin up VMs without even the, the application owner knowing it. So, if, uh, so basically they will see a dip in the capacity, but before they know it, it's uh, re replenished. And uh, there are some things that we uh, use to uh, collect diagnostics from all the hypervisor down cases. We want to collect the diagnostics such that we can uh, learn from patterns and uh, later on we can do a um, predictive uh, eviction of VMO, VMs from those uh, hypervisors. So if you see a certain pattern that is leading to a hypervisor down state, we can look at that and say, Let's, let's notify the VM owners and ask them to evict, evict before the, uh, the hypervisors have issues. So this is a, another fully automated process. The, the key um, uh, KPI here is to reduce the, uh, the, the time to detect and time to remediate. So we were doing this uh, over days. You know, we would take about like three or so days to detect a hypervisor down issue and uh, remediate. Now it's in near real time. And the, it could be real time if we didn't have the, the, the cooling period and we uh, opted to have that sort of the, the quiet period so that we don't accidentally react to false alarms. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is the, the remediation workflows. So all the automated jobs in, in our um, re remediation engine, we, on, the, on the left side you have sort of the the various life cycles of various stages of the, uh, the hypervisor. So it's um, getting the, uh, the, the, the assets bootstrapped to um, provisioned to um, operating and you're doing an ongoing ping, you're checking the hardware, uh, monitoring, you're um, doing decom, or sometimes even the operator looks at it and manually flips it to a a bad state. So the thumbs down basically shows the hypervisor that's in a, in a bad state or asset is in a bad state. So that goes through a, um, a auto remediation. So we have uh, various uh, pools in terms of, uh, there are some assets that we fully um, operate and remediate. There are certain uh, pools which are exclusive to a specific uh, group. So they want to manage their own um, assets. So for them, we act as a pass-through and notify the, the folks. And uh, the idea is, you know, if there's a faulty uh, asset, we would do a, uh, the VM migration. It's, we call it the faulty migrate. And uh, get all the, the VMs out of the, out of the hypervisor. And uh, uh, get it to a, a, a healthy state. So, so a thumbs up basically brings it, so the job, the remediation job succeeded. And there are times where not all, always, you know, the, all the hypervisor issues are remediatable. So there are times where we would have to work with the, the, the vendor and uh, file a, um, a RMA ticket and get that uh, rectified and uh, taken care of. So this whole thing, again, it's a, it's a lot of steps. It's a lot of, uh, you know, passing the, the buck from one team to another. So automating this has definitely helped in terms of um, getting the, uh, the faulty assets from, you know, at, 
under 1.5%. So we used to run at you know, greater than 5% faulty assets in the system, and getting that down to 1.5% or less, it's actually much lesser than that today. Um, it's, it's gotten to a, a, a much better utilization of your assets and a huge cost savings. Um, the, um, the next thing I wanted to uh, touch upon is, you know, so the, we, we have all these, um, all these um, um, tooling automation, but are we done? What's our future direction? So we want to look at, um, we have a ton more work to do. We have automated a lot, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done. So we want to get to a, the, the, the cloud lifecycle management almost zero touch. So we should be able to run the, the cloud fully automated, a self-healing cloud, if there's an issue with the control plane, sends a signal to the remediation engine, the remediation engine kicks in, uh, repairs it, and brings it back to the, the normal state. So all those things need to be built. So there's a lot of uh, bits that we are still missing. And uh, another thing we're looking at is continuizing the, uh, the, the open stack services and looking at not just containerizing it, but also managing the, the containers, clusters. Uh, we're evaluating uh, Kubernetes at this point, and we're, we're uh, looking forward to building the, the next generation cloud. So there's a, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of uh, challenges. You're working with the cutting edge technologies like um, uh, Kubernetes and all. You know, you're uh, looking at a fully automated uh, cloud operation. So we're, we're definitely excited in this journey, and there's a lot more things that need to be built. So um, if you guys are, if there's a builder in you who's excited about the, the scale, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We're hiring. We're looking for great people. Um, thank you very much. I'll uh, take questions. So there's a mic up there, if you don't mind walking up to the mic. I have uh, two questions. Sure. Um, so by looking at this model, uh, what are the capabilities the, the your tenants actually get out of the platform? Because from a, as a service provider, you are actually taking all the actions when the failure happens. Mm -hmm. What kind of capabilities that your or, or tenants that is hosting their uh, workloads on this platform, uh, they're, they're getting from this platform? What is the compelling drivers for them to uh, migrate to this platform? It's uh, so it's the eBay cloud. You know we have elasticity, so that's a key thing so with the cloud so, model. So and el elasticity can, provided at this uh, provider level or at the tenant level. So, so we provide uh, like you know you can spin up a, a compute. I mean if you can spin up a VM, and you can do your test project, and you can fold them once you're done. So with the cloud model, it enables you that, right? So the the value to the the tenant would be to easily, without going through 10 levels of uh, infrastructure procurement, you can directly go and spin up an instance, do your testing, and... Do, do they have to read it their code to do that? Or you, that's what I asked. Like, so the, the, the major problem that I see from, from my perspective is if, if I have to migrate my existing applications onto the OpenStack uh, to use this uh, capabilities or APIs, to be very intelligent there, so they may have to read their codes to call those APIs to do that. Or I can provide it from the, uh, as a service provider level. So, uh, like I said, you know, you're, you're running in a cloud. You're, uh, you can uh, do whatever is needed for your application. That's all on the tenant. What we do is you know, we enable the, the cloud operations. So if you want to spin up a VM, so we use OpenStack, clearly. And we use that to, uh, you know, use no uh, uh, Cinder as the, the um, block storage and give you all the uh, services, the front end of the, the front office services to get you enabled. Okay. Right. My, my second question is about the, what kind of capabilities that you provide to your tenants uh, so that they know their, uh, the health of their, uh, their infrastructure at the same time, health of their life cycle, health, health of their security. Do, they, do you guys provide any? kind of capabilities from the cloud for your tenants? So we are uh, looking at uh, building uh, services. So we are, um, that's in, in the works. So we're looking at um, creating a, a telemetry equivalent. So we can look at um, all the, uh, the stats from the VM. And you know, we can subscribe to certain things. And you can get alerted based on. So again, that's on the, on the data okay. plane side. The monitoring that I described here was on the 
uh, on the control plane, the infrastructure, sort of that, the, the layer under between the hardware and the, 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 um, the, the open stack services. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, thank you, and could you speak about, uh, talk about the um, automation tools you use? One mm -hmm. question there, one is, can you confirm that you look like you send everything to one single Elasticsearch cluster for ev all of your infrastructure? Just, that sounds like amazingly large. And, yeah. And mm -hmm. what those indexers are? So it is a single Elasticsearch cluster. And there's a question about the uh, automation tool. You talked a lot about automation, automation, but can you talk about which tools? So a lot of it is uh, homegrown. And uh, that's where I, I think you know, we, can, we can partner with uh, the community and make that better. I'm sure a lot of folks are running through the same uh, issues. So let's solve this, these problems together. So um, I would love to have uh, more um, participation there. Hi, uh, two questions. First one's hopefully easy. Uh, you have the cool off period to avoid systems being shut down if basically you get a false positive. Do you have the means to go in and stop that from happening if the problems escalated beyond? Yes, okay. yes. I, I forgot to mention that. Thanks for asking. Yeah. So what we have is, you know, we, even if it's uh, not a, a site-wide incident and it's uh, you know, a lot of hypervisor are going down, uh, we rarely have that issue. So if we basically have a threshold, if it crosses more than like X number, then we would flag it and stop that um, hypervisor uh, down remediation process. Yeah. And we want to be extra cautious because um, you re re react to a false alarm, it could be, Cascade. Uh, yeah. Uh, second question is, is I know eBay uh, spends a lot of time engineering uh, resources on uh, heat and power management and conservation of, of both of those. Uh, do you do any work with that team to be able to basically uh, spin up and spin down servers or to better consolidate services on to uh, hypervisors that are, are underutilized so in other words, have you, have you gone to the full step of automating the system towards those energy and heat conservation goals? Not, uh, not right now, but that's a great uh, opportunity that we can look into. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Just one question. Um, could you share a bit of detail on how you made your decisions on storage-centric uh, areas, like what kind of storage you used and you know, you mentioned Cinder, you know, any of the services you use and so on. That's uh, slightly out of the, uh, the, the topic. Yeah. But um, maybe we can chat offline? Sure. Yeah. Hi. You mentioned in the beginning of the presentation about, you talk about regions and AZs. Mm -hmm. So did you mean OpenStack region and OpenStack, OpenStack AZs or something, something else? So the, these, let's say, um, I, it's a cloud concept. So you, you want to have uh, uh, regions. You want to have multiple regions. Regions could be like um, US West, US East. And uh, within each region, you could have uh, multiple AZs, which are having separate, uh, if uh, one of the AZs go get him, or the, the region gets made back up. If the, one of the AZs get impacted, your workload's running on another AZ still functions because it has a separate network backhaul, separate um, power supply, everything, right? So that's, that's the, uh, the AZ region model. Right. So, so that's but, what but I was trying to describe. OpenStack, a, yeah, open stack has a concept of region and concept of AZ as well. Yeah, just to answer that question, I think I was The mic is not on. Try again. Amazon Google style model where AZ is a fairly a large control plane includes compute storage network. So, so I understood that what you what you presented is not the OpenStack concept of reason. Exactly. Right. Okay. Exactly. All right. Any other questions? 
All right. Thank you. Thank you.